everybody. I am your host, Gray Waste Tim, and you are in the den of the Gray Waste. And today we are uh, following up from the last video I did, A Song of Blood and Citrus, which is doing quite well. Thank you for everyone who watched, who liked and commented and shared and all that. Yeah, And uh, for those who don't know, the crux of that one was uh, not only doing some analysis on A Song of Ice and Fire, but doing some film analysis on the Godfather films, uh, Francis Ford Coppola's trilogy of the Godfather and the dangerous orange trope that it had established and made famous. Um, I can't say for certain if the Godfather created the dangerous orange trope, if they're the first, but they definitely, definitely made it famous. And here you can see a couple stills from the movie of uh, the black, like everything's in black and white, but the oranges are colored in where oranges are important for tragedy, death, all that kind of stuff. Uh, in fact, scattered across the three Godfather films, there are 23 instances uh, where oranges show are, are, are in a scene right before uh, a character dies or, or has a tragic moment or some kind of downfall or something. Uh, start it as a, as a uh, accident, if you if you've seen the video, I go over uh, the uh, quotes from Francis Ford Coppola and from his and from production designer uh, to uh, Dave Tuvalaris. Uh, oranges were originally just a a cheap uh, backdrop, a prop to to add color and contrast to a gloomy film. But once they noticed just how many times the oranges came up in the first film, uh, they they heavily leaned into it. In the second, and then just went overboard in in the third. In the third film, where the oranges just mean like something something bad is about to happen. And when I'm looking at a song of ice and fire, and realize like, hey, uh, this scene with Doran when he's first introduced out in the water gardens, and the oranges are falling. This sounds a lot like The Godfather. And when I went and reread. Uh, Doran's introduction, which is the chapter we're going to be looking at, the Captain of Guards. Uh, it is an Ario Hota POV chapter. It's one of two that he gets. He gets one in a, in feast and one in dance. Um, where, uh, yeah. So when we first meet him, like these these oranges are falling, and and it's very it's very mafioso. Like you really get the feel like Doran Martell might as well be like. Not just Prince Martel, he may as well be called Don Martel, like the light that he is presented in. And the more you look into it, especially his interaction with the Sand Snakes, his way, his, his uh, way of doing things, it's very, very mafioso. And then it mirrors uh, the story of Michael Corleone very, very well. And I think if if, if we follow the transition, like the the introduction of Dorne is like Michael's last scene and, and the instances of losing family and losing friends along the way until you end up alone in the courtyard, the way Michael does at the end of Godfather three seems to be the trajectory that Dorne Martell is taking. Can I not super? Ch hmm. The channel is supposed to be monetized. I guess I thought I had super chats enabled. Um, well, if you can't send super chats, then there is PayPal. I'll drop there. I just dropped. I dropped a link to my PayPal. Um, as a four, I thought I had. I haven't had gotten a super chat yet. I thought they were enabled, but I guess they aren't. I'll have to look into that. But uh, there's a PayPal for now. If you want to send in comments or questions or just support the channel, those will always appreciate it. Uh, I'm again. I I'm small time, and I plan to stick small time. I do not want to make YouTube a career because once it becomes a job, it stops being fun. That's the way, that's just the way I look at it. So I'm not reliant on PayPal's and super chats the way some content creators are, because this is still a hobby, but they are always appreciated. I'll, I'll just look at it as like, you know, this is the bar tip jars at the end of the table. If you want to leave something, that's great. Thank you very much, but it's not required or necessary. Um, I have a job that I like that pays the bills. No, I will never reveal what that is. I don't need some sociopath who disagreed with my take on a work of fiction trying to get me fired. But I, uh, it does allow me to me and uh, Damon and Cassie to live a fairly comfortable life. Um, but thank you, thank you. So 
might as well just get right into it. Uh, so, so this is going to be a first of a series of streams. Uh, if you saw the initial tweet, and if you've watched the show and read both watched the show and read the books, then you know, you know <laughs> that Dorn got done dirty by Dan and Dave. They got done, so, them and the Ironborn, they were done so dirty. I mean, like Doran, uh, Doran Martell is, is, is not, is not used in any meaningful way. Um, might as well, let's come back to me. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Dor Doran Martell is not utilized and they got a good actor for him. Um, Ariane and Quentin are completely cut out. Arya Hota is there. He's technically there. Um, he's the big African American guy with the axe. Um, he doesn't say anything or do anything or display any kind of agency, emotion, or humanity at all. But he's there. He gets shanked in the shoulder blade and falls, and that's the end of him. But he technically was there. <laughs> but uh, now we're gonna so we're gonna look at the real Ario Hota, who is our 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 eyes in on Dorn. And then later in dance, he becomes a silent watcher to uh, Doran's real, real plans when he sends the Sand Snakes out. Um, so this will be a first of a series of streams looking at the Dornish chapters. This first one I'm doing solo. I want to try and, uh, you know, cut my teeth on, on this whole symbolism, symbolism that I've been learning by working with uh, David Lightbringer. Try it out on my own. Uh, Dave will be on my channel for for a stream i'm gonna have him for the second ario hota chapter which is the watcher uh, that's that's the that's the chapter with the snake stew food porn and all of that which like just really really hammers home what's what's happening with george's symbolism um the queen maker which is arianne's chapter when they try to queen uh crown marcella baratheon Dave wants to do on his own channel because that's a symbolism smorgasbord. That's when we first meet Dark Star, so I'll leave him for that. But I'm going to try and cover uh, the Soiled Knight, which is the lone Eris Oakheart chapter, and I'll probably do Princess in the Tower. And I'm actually going to extend invites to other people. I want to try and start having more more guests. Uh, Quinn, the GM, I definitely want to invite. Uh, I think for the air, I'm going to extend one to him for the Eris Oakheart chapter, and then. Probably like girl medals and Aura I Zebra from uh, from Direwolf City or two other people. I'll extend invites to, and I'm just I'm looking to branch out. So hopefully, I'll I'll be sending them messages in the coming days, and hopefully we can get get some get some people on. Especially if I do airy and chapters, be nice to have an actual lady on to do. So I'm not doing a bad female voice on top of a bad Spanish accent that I'm already doing with Doran Martell. <laughs> <laughs> Zenial, I volunteer as tribute. You know, you know, I might keep it in mind. <laughs> I might keep it in mind. Um, yeah, but there's there's definitely you know more people people out there that I that I like and I respect that have helped me along the way, and I, I want to pay it forward to. But uh, so yeah, so we're gonna do Captain of the Guards, just me. And without further ado, we may as well just get straight into it. So we'll. Just bring up the chapter, bring up the Kindle. Share that. All right, make me smaller and. Hmm. What can I reap? There we go. Okay. So this is, yes, this is the Captain of Guards. It is the first Arya Hota chapter in Feast. It is the second chapter overall in Feast. And it is our introduction to Doran Martell and the Sand Snakes. The blood oranges are well past ripe, the prince observed in a weary voice when the captain rolled him onto the terrace. After that, he did not speak again for hours. It was true about the oranges. A few had fallen to burst open on the pale pink marble. The sharp, sweet smell of them filled Hota's nostrils each time he took a breath. No doubt the prince could smell them too, as he sat beneath the trees in the rolling chair Maester Colet had made for him, with its goose-down cushions and rumbling wheels of ebony and iron. For a long while, 
the only sounds were the children splashing in the pools and fountains, and once a soft plop as another orange dropped onto the terrace to burst. Then, from the far side of the palace, the captain heard the faint drum beat of boots on marble. All right, so yeah, so so right here, when you take in the Godfather stuff, especially the dangerous oranges, it's like the the very second we meet this man, the stage is set for tragedy. And when you when you think of like the story of of the of the Corleone family, and you compare it to here, then it becomes obvious that like this something bad is going to happen to this man in the end of his story and everyone that that's that he speaks to everyone that gets in any way involved anyone who enters just this guy's gravitational force is potentially on is potentially on the chopping block and it's spelled out right there in those goddamn oranges and then uh so one of the comments that I did get in in the blood and citrus video and I don't, I don't know if there's someone who is being che- just someone being cheeky because of how much I've worked with Dave, or or if they're being legitimate. But they did ask, like, are the falling oranges meteor symbolism? And the thing is, it's like they can be because in Dorne, if we think of like the, uh, we have two instances, one potential and one definite: uh, the hammer of the waters, the breaking of the arm of Dorne, potentially is a meteor strike. Uh, you can check out a lot more of the streams I've done with Dave on Ironborn. Uh, we we bring up the Arm of Dorne, the Hammer of the Waters, things like the Thousand Islands and all these other catastrophes like Mo- Moat Kalen's another one uh, that could possibly be the results of meteor strikes and, and uh, aftermath flooding. So that's a potential one. But then there's Starfall, which is a definite meteor strike, a... a uh, a white a white stone lands in Starfall, is recovered by the progenitor of House Dane, and that is what the sword Dawn is forged from. So, so potential meteor strike with the hammer of the waters in Dorne, definite meteor strike at Starfall. So right there, Dorne is a potential hotbed of meteor activity. So the blood orange is falling and bursting. Um, if we think of like the red comet falling and bursting, like if the red comet hits the wall or has some kind of impact and bursts apart, that would be like the blood oranges falling and hitting these marble, this the marble floor here. So Obara, he knew her stride, long-legged, hasty, angry. In the stables by the gates, her horse would be lathered and bloody from her spurs. She always rode stallions and had been heard to boast that she could master any horse in Dorne and any man as well. The captain could hear other footsteps as well. The quick, soft scuffing of Maester Kaelit hurrying to keep up. A bar of sand always walked too fast. She is chasing after something she can never catch. The prince had told her once in the captain's hearing. Okay, so we have... This is our introduction to Obara Sand. Uh, so o- Oberyn Martell has eight daughters, the Sand Snakes. Obara is the eldest. Uh, she is the daughter of an old town sex worker. Um, she is very much the warrior, uh, first and foremost, among Oberyn's daughters. She's she she gives the impression of like of like a, a of a Dornish She Hulk. Is what she is what she's like, and she is the first to confront Doran here. So we'll get back to reading. When she appeared beneath the triple arc, Arya Hotov swung his long axe sideways to block the way. The head was on a shaft of mountain ash six feet long, so she could not go around. Okay, okay, so. Hotah's about to speak, so we we have to give a voice for Arya Hotah, and I do have one in mind. Um, Arya Hotah, Arya Hotah is originally from Norvos. Okay, uh, Norvos is one of the free cities. Um, it's 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 a theocracy. Um, it's 
it's supposed to be run by a council of magisters, but really it's it's a group called the Bearded Priests who run the show. And their religion is so secretive that they don't even reveal the, the name of their god, even though this religion, this theocracy is what runs the entire town. Like the bells ringing alert people when to eat, when to pray, when to have sex. Like their lives are controlled by this religion, and yet they don't even know the name of their own god. So and, and children are are sold to the bearded priest just as children are sold to the red priests of Rolor. Um, so there and and Dor, uh, Ario is is known as he's called the Watcher in a Dance with Dragons, a silent watcher. So so there's definitely some Night's Watch symbolism in in there going on as well. Um, and the idea of children being given to the others or children being taken in by the watch that would be like uh like Matt's raider who grew up uh raised by the watch until his uh until his desertion but anyway so so norvos uh it's also one of the northern cities it's like on the same near the same latitude longitude of bravo so it's got a kind of kind of a colder atmosphere it's not it's not tropical the way volantis is uh it's more it's more cold um and he they wear like hair like oh hotels used to wearing his helm and his hair shirt and there's bears uh that's where like lines of like Aegon the third will tell us about i hear they love dancing bears in the free cities and it's like yeah those bears are coming from norvos so cold bearded men bears and this is a big 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 man with a big 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 weapon so the only voice I had in mind for him was the heavy from Team Fortress 2. I am Arya Hotuk guy, and this is my weapon. It is made of reworked cohoric steel. It costs 400,000 gold dragons to wield this weapon for 12 seconds. Oh, my nameless god. Who touched Sasha? They're wedded to their axes, okay? So his wife's name is Sasha. Who touched my axe? Some people say they can outsmart me. Maybe. Maybe. I have yet to meet one who can outsmart Blade. <laughs> Cry some more. All right, so that's Arya Hota. <laughs> my lady, no father. His voice was a bass grumble, thick with the accents of Norvos. The prince does not wish to be disturbed. Her face had been stoned before he spoke, then it hardened. You are in my way, Hota. Obara was the eldest sand snake, a big bone woman. Oh, I forgot to share the screen again. Okay. A big bone woman near to 30, with the close set eyes and rat brown hair of the old town whore who'd birthed her. Beneath a mottled sand silk cloak of dun and gold, her riding clothes were old brown leather, worn and supple. They were the softest things about her. So, yeah, so very hard, edgy woman. <laughs> like I said, like like a, like a, Dor a Dornish She-Hulk. That, that's just how I, I sort of view her. The only thing soft about her are her riding leathers. <laughs> On one hip, she wore a coiled whip Across her back, a round shield of steel and copper. She had left her spear outside. For that, Ario Hota gave thanks. Quick and strong as she was, the woman was no match for him, he knew. But she did not, and he had no wish to see her blood upon the pale pink marble. Maester Colette shifted his weight from foot to foot. Lady Obara, I, I tried to tell you. Does he know that my father is dead? Obara asked the captain, paying the maester no more mind than she would a fly, if any fly had been foolish enough to buzz about her head. He does, the captain said. He had a bird. Death had come to Dorne on raven wings, writ small and sealed with a blob of hard red wax. Kalit must have sensed what was in the letter, for he'd given it to Hota to deliver. The prince thanked him, but for the longest time he would not break the seal. All afternoon, he'd sat with the parchment in his lap, watching the children at their play. 
He watched until the sun went down and the evening air grew cool enough to drive them inside. Then he watched the starlight on the water. It was moonrise before he sent Hota to fetch a candle so he might read his letter beneath the orange trees in the dark of night. Okay, so right here, we get... This is giving us more of a sense of Doran Martell's character, right? The way he waits. He waits to open the letter. He waits, sounds like almost a day and a half before he even bothers to peel back the seal and and, re and read this thing. Um, you can see like how it's it's slow as if as if if he doesn't read it he, it's like if he doesn't read it the news will go away like you know out out of mind out out of sight out of mind seems to seems to be like the the, the feeling right here and yeah uh death comes to dorn on raving wings uh dark wings dark words we've heard that before uh ravens never bring good news definitely being the thing and and the idea too of a, of a black raven going down into Dorne, which is which is like viewed as sunny and orange and and blue skies and white. It, it is a very deep contrast for when the black bird arrives there. So going back, Obara touched her whip. Thousands are crossing the sands afoot to climb the bone way, so they may help Alaria bring my father home. The seps are packed to bursting, and the red priests have lit their temple fires. In the pillow houses, women are coupling with every man who comes to them and refusing any coin. And sun spear on the broken arm, along the green blood, in the mountains, out in the deep sand. Everywhere, everywhere, women tear their hair and men cry out in rage. The same question is heard on every tongue. What will Doran do? What will his brother do to avenge our murdered prince? She moved closer to the captain. And you say he does not wish to be disturbed? So, yeah, we get a set like just how popular Oberyn Martell was, right? And I don't even think, <laughs> to be honest... I don't, I don't think she's lying. I don't think she's exaggerating one little bit about how Dorn is responding to Oberyn Martell's death. That man was smooth. I don't, it's like, it's, and, and I think, I think when you come in the fandom, it's, it's hard to find anyone who, ha who hates Oberyn Martell. Except maybe ordered the green hand, but <laughs> Yeah, Oberyn Martell, definitely a fan favorite and definitely, definitely a man about town when it comes to Dorn. A man about the whole damn country. He does not wish to be disturbed, Arya Hota said again. The captain of guards knew the prince be guarded. Knew, he, knew the prince he guarded. Once long ago, a Kahlo youth had come from Norvos, a big broad-shouldered boy with a mop of dark hair. That hair was white now, and his body bore the scars of many battles. But his strength remained, and he kept his long axe sharp, as the bearded priest had taught him. She shall not pass, he told himself, and said, The prince is watching the children at their play. He is never to be disturbed when he is watching the children at their play. So, yeah, so... so Norvos, yeah, it's sold to the bearded priest. He he's raised to just be a warrior and a bodyguard first and foremost. Uh, sim simple instructions for simple men. That's that's the way he Ario Hota was raised, and we get that sense when he speaks. It's kind of a a very simple way of speaking, and that could be because one, he's not from Westeros, the common tongue, more than likely not his first tongue. He's speaking whatever. Valerian dialect they're speaking out in Norvos but also he's and 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 that just goes more into like his big brutish character it's it's like Victorian in a way just although Victorian does seem to get less dumb after he gets his his uh cool nifty fire hand but uh but it's a very simple way of speaking short words short brazen to the point Hota said Obara Sand you will remove yourself from my path, else I shall take that long axe and... Captain, came the command from behind. Let her pass. I will speak with her. 
The prince's voice was hoarse. Ario Hota jerked his long axe upright and stepped to one side. Obara gave him a lingering that last look and strode past, the maester hurrying at her heels. Kalit was no more than five feet tall and bald as an egg. A sh short bald king, little like a little Varus or a big or a big fat Aegon. His face was so smooth and fat that it was hard to tell his age, but he had been here before the captain, had even served the prince's mother. Despite his age and girth, he was still nimble enough and clever as they came, but meek. He is no match for any sand snake, the captain thought. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, Dave. Yeah, yep, yep. Uh, I'm wearing, uh, brought on the the Vito Corleone costume from the, from the Blood and Citrus for, for Doran Martell's introductions. Yes, thank you. So, Kalit here, he, he has very much... Um, just just description of him physically it sounds a lot sounds like varus varus is also uh bald as an egg faces round uh kind of girthy you know kind of kind of plump uh, a husky boy but nimble on his feet like Var they say like Var varus despite being such a big man is uh as you can hardly hear his footsteps cuz they're like so soft as if like like he's wearing like little little slippers and little dainty and with little dainty feet and Kalit's giving the same impression but he's meek he doesn't have and while Varus presents himself as meek we know that Varus is, is very cunning and and willing to get his hands dirty I mean he kills Kevin Lannister himself with a crossbow so, in the shade of the orange trees, the prince sat in his chair with his gouty legs propped up before him and heavy bags beneath his eyes. Though whether it was grief or gout that kept him sleepless, Hota could not say. Below in the fountains and the pools, the children were still at their play. The youngest was no more than five, the oldest nine and ten. Half were girls and half were boys. Hota could hear them splashing and shouting at each other in high, shrill voices. It was not so long ago that you were one of the children in those pools, Obara, the prince said when she took one knee before his rolling chair. Yep, so so Doran here, Doran here watching the children at their play. And and I made the connection. Uh it's it, it's very reminiscent of Vito Corleone's final moments with his grandson at Anthony, uh out there in the garden playing just before Vito uh suffers his his heart attack. And so this is the impression that we get for Doran. Uh, we see what what is important to him, and it is the children of Doran. It is the he looks at the children. It's like this is the future, and he gets the sense of like this is a sad man who's trying to who's trying to you know keep his mind on good and pleasant things. Watching the kids play in the water garden. The water gardens are a place where where all the children are welcome, whether they're the, the children of, of lords or whether the children of commoners, they're, uh, everyone in the vicinity is allowed into the water gardens. You get So you get the sense of like, yeah, this this is just what's important to Doran Martell. And, and it's sidelining just the absolute grief that this man is carrying and, and the the dark things, the dark, dangerous, and dirty things that he's going to have to do to see his vengeance play out. And it, it's it's a contrast because he's he's watching the children play, yet still working towards this path of revenge. And and it's it's worlds colliding very much in that sense. Because um, if you if you've heard the phrase like he who seeks revenge should should dig two graves. And with Doran Martell, especially when we get to the Watcher um, and, and that chapter with the Snake Stew, it's like, no, Oberyn Martell, you need to dig like eight, nine, ten graves because you're probably going to take your entire family down with you in, in, in this in this uh, this this vengeance pursuit. And uh, do you just want to check? Oh, I got a PayPal in, so let's go see what that's about did that come with a message oh me trans
payment from Cameron, uh, but I don't see don't see any message attached to that. Did you have uh, did you have a message? Um, I'm just not seeing it. Oh, well, but, th but thank you. Thank you to everyone who's sending things in. Um, yeah, not seeing any ma message attached to that. Okay, but for those who don't know, if you do send a PayPal, um, you can include a message if you have like a question or a comment, um, and I will read those. I'll also only uh say first name so i'm not i'm not going to say full names but so thank you cameron for for the for the paypal and if and if you are in the chat and you do have a message that you meant to send to that please please uh post it in the chat and i'll try and get to it then so where did we leave off oh okay so she snorted it has been 20 years or near enough to make no matter, and I was not here long. I am the whore's whelp, or had you forgotten? When he did not answer, she rose again and put her hands upon her hips. My father has been murdered. He was slain in single combat during a trial by battle, Prince Doran said. By law, that is no murder. He was your brother. He was. What do you mean to do about his death? The prince turned his chair laboriously to face her. Though he was but two and fifty, Doran Martell seemed much older. His body was soft and shapeless beneath his linen robes, and his legs were hard to look upon. The gout had swollen and reddened his joints grotesquely. His left knee was an apple, his right a melon, and his toes had turned to dark red grapes. So ripe, it seemed as though a touch would burst them. Even the weight of a coverlet could make him shudder, though he bore the pain without complaint. Silence is a prince's friend, the captain had heard him tell his daughter once. Words are like arrows, Ariane. Once loosed, you cannot call them back. I have written to Lord Tywin. Written? If you were half the man my father was, I am not your father. That I knew. Obar Obara's voice was thick with contempt. You would have me go to war. I know better. You need not even leave your chair. Let me avenge my father. You have a host in the prince's pass. Lord Ironwood has another in the bone way. Grant me the one and nim the other. Let her ride the king's road while I, stir while I turn the marcher lords out of their castles and hook round to march on Old Town. All right, so going back to the Godfather, so he's your brother. It and this is like uh, if we see if you Godfather, Sopranos, Mafia nature, like Goodfellas, blood for blood, just just this this whole Sicilian thing, centuries upon centuries of of bloodshed, where where it's it, and it's a ne it's a never ending cycle of violence and i think that's that's what george is really highlighting on here and it's what we'll get uh in a Lar uh, sans speech when she says like well when does it end uh your father went out to get vengeance for his sister for your aunt now he's dead who's going to hold a skull cannot hold me and and that's the thing but it's like it's it's never ending this the the cycle of hate the cycle of revenge and and the need to break from that and that is why like as dave has highlighted many times on his channel our discussions like the idea of a song of ice and fire ending with just a big battle where the others are defeated in some kind of war like no it, it's going to be reconciliation that needs to be the end but reconciliation is hard and we've seen that over and over and over uh the the night's watch and the wildlings just like uh the blackwoods and the brackens are, are hatfield and mccoys um the golden company four generations now uh these are guys like the guys in the golden company who are following fagon these are guys that are carrying the torch for their grandfathers and their great grandfathers' war, and Doran Martell is 
falling into that same trap and it's going to lead his family to ruin. How would you hope to hold Old Town? It will be enough to sack it. The wealth of Hightower. Is it gold you want? It is blood I want. Lord Tywin shall deliver us the mountain's head. And who will deliver us Lord Tywin's head? The mountain has always been his pet. The prince gestured toward the pools. Obara, look at the children if it please you. It does not please me. I get more pleasure from driving my spear into Lord Tywin's belly. I'll make him sing the reins of Castamir as I pull his bowels out and look for gold. Tywin Lannister does not shit gold. <laughs> look, the prince repeated. I command you. A few of the older children lay face down upon the smooth pink marble browning in the sun. Others paddled in the sea beyond. Three were building a sandcastle with a great spike that resembled the spear tower of the old palace. A score or more had gathered in the big pool to watch the battles as smaller children rode through the waist-deep shallows on the shoulders of the larger and tried to shove, or, shove each other into the water. Every time a pair went down, the splash was followed by a roar of laughter. They watched a nut-brown girl yank a towel-headed boy off his brother's shoulder to tumble him headfirst into the pool. So I think this is like a game. I think this is chicken. And we never know. The lifeguards never let us play that in the public pool. Anytime you got a game of chicken going, they, they always they always stopped you and blew their whistles. <laughs> Italians. Italians don't <laughs> reconcile. Yeah, that's that's the that it I mean. Okay, okay, okay. I guess so. So a little bit about me, right? Like, um, I'm I'm German and Irish for the most part, but I uh most of my family is Catholic, and my aunt, my mother's younger sister, she married an Italian man. <laughs> uh and, and I so I have a half I have a half Italian cousins who and they they all they're all Catholic, so <laughs> Well, I myself am not Italian. I, I I have I do have you know some 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 uh, real world first person experience with the Italian attitude and the the way they the way they handle things and gabagool. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, like uh, uh, Italy. Even though even still, there's like still even to this day and age in Italy, there's still like that that sharp divide between the north and the south. <laughs> Oh, Dave, you're Italian? Okay, you could probably speak more on... But did you... And Dave, you, didn't you tell me you've never seen the Godfather films? You, you, you're a disgrace to your people! Watch the movies! <laughs> and the, the hand talking is great, though. It's something I've incorporated. Um, I've seen my uncle... I've seen my uncle do it. <laughs> All right, <laughs> I'm going back to this. Uh, your father played that same game once, as I did before him, said the prince. We had ten years between us, so I had left the pools by the time he was old enough to play. But I would watch him when I came to visit mother. He was so fierce even as a boy, quick as a water snake. I oft saw him topple boys much bigger than himself. He reminded me of that day. Of that the day he left for King's Landing. He swore he wouldn't do it one more time. Else I would never have let him go. <laughs> let him go? Obara laughed. <laughs> As if you could have stopped him. The Red Viper of Dorne went where he would. He did. I wish I had some word of comfort too. I did not come to you for comfort. Her voice was full of scorn. The day my father came to claim me, my mother did not wish for me to go. She is a girl, she said, and I do not think that she is yours. I had a thousand other men. He tossed his spear at my feet and gave my mother the back of his hand across the face. Slap! So she began to weep. Girl or boy, we fight our battles, he said, but the gods let us choose our weapons. He pointed to the spear. Then to my mother's tears, 
and I picked up the spear. I told you she was mine, my father said, and took me. My mother drank herself to death within the year. They say that she was weeping as she died. Obara edged closer to the prince in his chair. Let me use the spear. I ask no more. All right, so Obara coming home with dad. Not a fond memory as a reader to see that, but something that definitely sticks out to her. And also the other thing about Obara being Oberyn's daughter is it said that all eight of his children have his viper eyes. So so even if it, if it didn't take this moment of her picking up the spear to show that like, yeah, she is a daughter of Oberyn Martell, the eyes would still be a, a dead giveaway. It is a deal to ask Obara. I shall sleep on it. You have slept too long already. You may be right. I will send word to you at Sunspear. So long as the word is war. Obara turned upon her heel and strode off as angrily as she had come. Back to the stables for a fresh horse and another headlong gallop down the road. All right, so yeah, so that's Obara San. And as the chapter progresses, we'll we'll meet two more. We'll meet Nymeria, Lady Nim, and we will meet Tyeen. And and we can see like their we get to see their personalities play out in the way that they respond to Doran and when they talk with him about the things that they want. Now Obara wants straight up war. Like, no, let's sack King's Landing, let's take Old Town, we'll we'll rush the high tower. Well, you know, we can hold it. We can do it. And 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 that is obviously not what Doran wants. Doran is being very calm. He's very collected. He does not want to start a big war. He recognizes that Doran is the least populous of the Seven Kingdoms. Something he'll say later, which nice, nice to know, like that actually means that the North, despite how sparsely populated the North is, actually has a bigger population than Dorne does. And, and it is through, and, and that's the thing about Dorne. The reason Dorne was able to resist the Targaryens so long is because it's the Targaryens were fighting on their turf. The Dornish could wage their guerrilla war in Dorne, high, going into their hidey holes, high, uh, going out into the desert, going out into the Red Mountains, poisoning the wells along the way uh they they could they could skirt back but the idea of the dornish progressing forward going out of dorn and taking the war to the rest of westeros that's a whole other thing and it's something that dorn is not prepared for um dorn can fight a defensive war within its own territory but Dorn cannot do the uh, Dorn cannot take the offensive and push forward. That's why, as much as the Targaryens did when in when it was Aegon the Conqueror, when it was Daeron the First, you saw though once once they repelled once they repelled them, there was never any kind of infiltration further than the Dornish marches. They pretty much went back through the Prince's Pass and went home. It's not like Dorn was ever seeking to expand except for the occasional i said except for the occasional flare up in the dornish marches they've always sort of stuck to themselves that's what they can do they could they can dig their feet in and fight and fight like that but moving forward then 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 they're just lining up for a slaughter but obara sand does not recognize that she's hot-headed she's thinking solely of vengeance for her father blood for again the, the sicilian thing blood for blood but when revenge is, is your is your central point, it's your the thing first and foremost on your mind, that will cloud your judgment, which is a sort of another another thing I can link back to the Godfather. Uh, why Michael Corleone succeeds where his brothers don't. Well, Sonny Corleone, who was supposed to take over after Vito, um, it was his temper. His his temper clouded his judgment. 
and and that's what leads him to that's what leads to his death in the first godfather movie and then fredo fredo is just seen as meek he's weak so he's passed over for for michael so obara's obaro's like a like a a young female uh, version of sunny in that in that regard maester colette remained behind My prince, the little round man asked, do, do your legs hurt? The prince smiled faintly. Is the sun hot? Shall I fetch a draught for the pain? No, I need my wits about me. The maester hesitated. My, my prince, is it, is it prudent to allow Lady Obara to return to Sunspear? She is certain to inflame the common people. They loved your brother well. So did we all. He pressed his fingers to his temples. No, you are right. I must return to Sunspear as well. The little round man hesitated. Is that wise? Not wise, but necessary. Best send a rider to Ricasso and have him open my apartments in the Tower of the Sun. Inform my daughter, Ariane, that I will be there on the morrow. My little princess, the captain had missed her sorely. You will be seen, the maester warned. The captain understood. Two years ago, when they had left Sunspear for the peace and isolation of the water gardens, Prince Doran's gout had not been half so bad. In those days, he had still walked, albeit slowly, leaning on a stick and grimacing with every step. The prince did not wish his enemies to know how feeble he had grown and the old palace and its shadow city were full of eyes. Eyes, the captain thought, and the steps he cannot climb. He would need to fly to sit atop the Tower of the Sun. Oof. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So a lot to unpack there, right? So first, the gout. And this is something I've harped on many times, but it's something you know just continues to drill home. The oranges are a reflection of Doran's gout. And as I said, he's been at the water gardens for two years. And this has given the sense that the sand snakes have of you don't know your own people. You have not made a progression. You have not talked to them. You've been sitting in your, you know, your vacation house for two years now and you haven't moved. And because you haven't moved, your gout has gotten worse. It's festered. That's what I laid out in, in, in the Blood and Citrus video. If Doran Martell would get up and move, both in a real-world sense of some exercise, but also in, in the symbolic sense of make a move on your plans, they wouldn't swell and fester the way they've been. That's why his gout is worse, and that is why his plans are failing. Not making a move. literally. And symbolically. And then, again, like, not being wanted to be seen as weak. That is important for a lord. Even if, even with the gout, even with the age, it's still a matter of presentation to look tough. Um, that's why The Sopranos is a great example. Um, after Tony is shot, Tony Soprano is shot and and uh, by Junior, and he makes his recovery. Um, he start noticing. He starts to notice that that his crew looks at him differently. Like when he says, "Like oh, I can't eat that; it has onions," um, because 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 of the sepsis. Um, he starts to look, and he sees like Bobby's playing basketball. Guys are lifting weights, so he picks a fight with his driver. Um, I'm blanking on his name, but he's a really jacked guy. Tony purposely picks a fight with him, beats his ass. For no good reason, but it's just to establish dominance. And then he goes into the bathroom and starts puking his guts out because of how much he exerted himself. And that that is what Doran Doran has to do here. Like, but Doran does not have Doran does not have the physicality to show dominance the way Tony Soprano does. Ario Hota does, and that's his muscle. But it it has to come from him. Doran has to be the one to show like uh show strength and pride and all of that but 
he's just so swollen and he looks so small and he's in his litter and he's being carried in his palanquin and then sitting in his wheelchair. That's why I said like uh, the, the description of Doran Martell, if you think, if you've seen the Godfather part three and, and the very end, Michael Corleone old sitting alone in that courtyard, that is, that is like a perfect picture of Doran Martell. Like even more so than what we got in the show, like that—that that is the true physical representation, I think, of of Doran Martell. If we were to envision him in real life, is is Michael Corleone at the very, very end of the trilogy? Right. Doran is kind of like when the show started with Jackie April as boss, and he got yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep, that's yeah, Jack Jackie April, the forgotten boss. Uh kept kept thing kept things running until until everything went tits up. Cancer's a bitch. All right, so I must be seen. Someone must pour oil on the waters. Dorn must be reminded that it still has a prince. He smiled wanly. Old and gouty though he is. If you return to Sunspear, you will need to give audience to Princess Marcella. Caleb said. Her white knight will be with her, and you know he sends letters to his queen. I suppose he does. The white knight, the captain frowned. Sir Aris had come to Dorne to attend his own princess, as Arya Hota had once come with his. Even their names sounded oddly alike, Arya and Aris. Yet there the likeness ended. The captain had left Norvos and its bearded priests, but Sir Eris Oakhart still served the Iron Throne. Hota had felt a certain sadness whenever he saw the man in the long snowy cloak, the times the prince had sent him down to Sunspear. One day, he sensed, the two of them would fight. On that day, Oakhart would die, with the captain's long axe crashing through his skull. But George, it's like you're giving the chapter away before, you, before we even get to it right there. He slid his hand up. That's not just foreshadowing, George. That's just telling us straight up what's going to happen. <laughs> he slid his hand along the smooth ashen shaft of his axe and wondered if that day was drawing nigh. All right. And then we got, of course, the ash tree symbolism. Um, ash trees, Asha, Greyjoy, uh, Ashai. The ash trees coming in here is more is is more long night symbolism. And uh so going back to the beginning when somebody asked uh, about about meteors too. So so there's another one, the House Martell sigil itself, as you can see behind me, uh, a spear go, going through a sun. There there's a there's some that's long night imagery, um, because because if the sun because if the sun goes out like the sun were speared and the sun goes out. There's your long night, uh, the spear going through the sun. It's it's the the moon, the moon getting in front of the sun, the eclipse. Uh, it's Nissa Nissa uh, being being stabbed by by Azor Ahai. If 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 uh, if, uh, if Nissa Nissa is the sun representation and Azor Ahai is our our Knights King figure, him stabbing Nissa Nissa is is the moon taking out the sun. Um, Danny and Danny and Drogo. Danny's played the Nissa Nissa figure a couple of times, but uh, he is the moon of Dor she is the moon of, of Drogo's life. Drogo is her sun and stars. Drogo goes out. Drogo dies. The sun dies, but the dragons from that death, the dragons are born. So yeah. So and and I've said like once when me and Dave were doing like the the uh, Dunkin' Egg reads especially the mystery night um when damon blackfire the second shows up the sigils themselves tell a story this is this is how much of a master george is is weaving all these in just the symbols the, the symbols by themselves still tell a story all their own and then it's just looking into the story to see how that is reflected here So going back to reading, so yeah, so he, uh, so our, so 
Ario is is thinking to himself, like, yeah, um, I'm going to have to fight this guy. And I'm going to be as like, as soon as I met the man, I knew I was going to be the one to kill him. <laughs> like that, 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 that's that's the thought that Ario or Ario is having. It's true. He did say it. The afternoon is almost done. The prince was saying, we will wait for morn. See that my litter is ready by first light. As you command, Caleb bobbed the bow. The captain stood aside to let him pass and listened to his footsteps to Wendell. Captain. The prince's voice was soft. Hotas strode forward, one hand wrapped about his long axe. The ash felt as smooth as a woman's skin against his palm. So, again, uh, the Norvosi, uh, these guys that are sold at, to the bearded priest and are raised to be these, like, warrior bodyguard hitmen type guys are wedded to their axe so so the axe which i said it is sasha if 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 uh if i'm gonna make ario hota the heavy then, then the axe is sasha yeah so so wed it to the axe uh and that's also can be like brit the ash tree symbolism well brand brand wed it to the trees is 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 a. Uh, is a cor direct correlation we can draw to that. So giving uh, giving this axe, this weapon, human characteristics, specifically uh, characteristics of a woman, of a wife, of a bride. And here we are just really leaning into that. The ash felt as smooth as a woman's skin against his palm. When he reached the rolling chair, he thumped its butt down hard to announce his presence. He's giving his wife a spanking. But the prince had eyes only for the... Ch now I regret saying that. <laughs> Did you have brothers, Captain? He asked. Back in Norvos, when you were young. Sisters? Both, Hota said. Two brothers. Three sisters. I was the youngest. The youngest and unwanted. Another mouth to feed, a big boy who ate too much and soon outgrew his clothes. Small wonder they had sold him to the bearded priests. So here we go again. Like this idea of children, unwanted children being sold to these religious sects. Because the same thing happens to Melisandre uh, in her when she has her flashback to when she was a girl, you know, Melanie, Lot 7, a uh, Tauros of Mir, same thing happens. He's he's sold. Too, family has too many kids, sell, so he's sold to the Red Temple in Mir. Uh, Craster sacrifices his sons to the others. He keeps his daughters to do his gross incest thing, but he the sons are given to the others. Um, Mance Raider is take as a child is taken in by the Night's Watch. Just, just these unwanted children being taken in by some kind, by a group of some kind, whether it be a, a religious order like the Red Priests or the Bearded Priests, whether it be a, a martial order like the Night's Watch. But we see this happening over and over and over again. And Hota gives us a connection to this, the, the unwanted child. I was the oldest, the prince said, and yet I am the last. After Moors and Oliver died in their cradles, I gave up hope of brothers. I was nine when Elia came, a squire in service at Saltshore. When the raven arrived with word that my mother had been brought to bed a month too soon, I was old enough to understand that meant the child would not live. Even when Lord Gargolin told me that I had a sister, I assured him that she must shortly die. Yet she lived by the mother's mercy. And a year later, Oberon arrived, squalling and kicking. I was a man grown when they were playing in these pools. Yet here I sit, and they are gone. And this becomes like a reflection with Elia Martell. Um, she cannot fulfill the prophecy that Rhaegar wants her to fulfill wants her to fulfill because she cannot have more children after the birth of Aegon. Uh, they say like she can't have any more kids. And this is following something that her mother went through. Um, it, it was hard, hard births. Uh, Doran, there's supposed to be five of these kids, but 
two died in the cradles and then there becomes this big age gap um and that happens too with Rhaegar's own parents how many dead siblings Rhaegar had and then that leads to a huge age gap between Rhaegar and Viserys and then an even bigger gap between Rhaegar and and Danny uh Doran Martell's has has the same has the same thing going on and then even himself his his own children he has three um, they also have a pretty pretty big age gap between them. There's like a five year age gap between Ariane and and uh, and Quentin, and then I think like an eight to ten year age gap between her and Tristane. Which in in at least here, like it, it it's it's different from from like Ned Stark and his children, who are only like a year. It's only like a year or two in between when kids were being popped out. Arya Hota did not know what to say to that. He was only a captain of guards and still a stranger to this land and its seven-faced god, even after all these years. Serve, obey, protect. He had sworn those vows at six and ten, the day he wed his axe. Simple vows for simple men, the bearded priests had said. He had not been trained to counsel grieving princes. He was still groping for some words to say when another orange fell with a heavy splat, no more than a foot from where the prince was seated. So more oranges dropping. Again, this these are more portents. Uh, some like just 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 the the writing is on the wall. Like George is really laying it down here with this dangerous orange connection, with this trope that we can connect back to the Coppola films. Oranges mean death some or if not death then definitely some sort of tragedy something's going to happen to this person something's going to happen to someone that's close to them that's going to make them wish they were dead it's it's always the the oranges always forebode some kind of tragedy doran winced at the sound as if somehow it had hurt him right right there the orange plops, the orange hits the ground, it bursts, and it's like Doran feels it. Enough, he sighed. It is enough. Leave me, Ario. Let me watch the children for a few more hours. When the sun set, the air grew cool, and the children went inside in search of supper. Still the prince remained beneath his orange trees, looking out over the still pools in the sea beyond. A serving man brought him a bowl of purple olives with flatbread, cheese, and chickpea paste. He ate a bit of it and drank a cup of the sweet, heavy, strong wine that he loved. When it was empty, he filled it once again. Okay, so yeah, so drinking cup after cup of strong wine is not helping the gout issue. Sometimes in the deep black hours of the morning, sleep found him in his chair. Only then did the captain roll him down the moonlit gallery, past a row of flooded pillars, and through a graceful arcway to a great bed with a crisp, cool linen sheets in a chamber by the sea. Doran groaned as the captain moved him, but the gods were good, and he did not wake. It's like it's like setting a newborn down. You don't want to wake him up. Let him. Hopefully, he sleeps through the night. The captain's sleeping cell adjoined his prince's. He sat upon the narrow bed and found his whetstone and oilcloth in their niche and set to work. Keep your long axe sharp, the bearded priest said told him, the day they branded him. He always did. As he honed the axe, Hototh thought of Norvos, the high city on the hill and the low beset beside the river. He could still recall the sounds of the three bells, the way that Noom's deep peals set his very bones to shuddering the proud, strong voice of Nara, sweet Nile's silvery laughter. The taste of winter cake filled his mouth again, rich with ginger and pine nuts and a bits of cherry, with nausea to wash it down, fermented goat's milk served in an iron cup and laced with honey. Like, it sounds, again, like Norvos being on more, more of a northern city, and this sounds almost Christmassy in, 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 its, in, its, uh, in its description. He saw his mother in her dress with the squirrel collar, 
the one she wore but once each year when they went to see the bears dance down the center steps. And he smelled the stench of burning hair as the bearded priest touched the brand to the center of his chest. The pain had been so fierce that he thought his heart might stop. Yet Ario Hota had not flinched. The hair had never grown back over the axe. Wrinkled little screen. So I'm just checking up, like, is orange as Noah's B? <laughs> but yeah, like, ferment, uh, yeah, here, fermented goat's milk. So, so I said, like, it's, it, it's, um, the Norvos culture seems to be like a, a blending of, of, uh, of, with the bears and the beards, but also the it's it's like a blending of of Russian and and steppe culture. So that area, like out out in central Russia, once you get past Moscow, past the European part, when you're getting more and more into the the Asian, the Central Asian area, closer and closer to Siberia, that that's that's kind of like the vibe that Norvos gives off. Only when both edges were sharp enough to shave with did the captain lay his ash and iron wife down. His, his wife! He lays his wife down on the bed. Oh, so tenderly, he lays Sasha down. Yawning, he pulled off his soiled clothes, tossed them on the floor, and stretched out on his straw-stuffed mattress. Thinking of the brand had made it itch, so he had to scratch himself before he closed his eyes. Dude, you're itchy and you're going to sleep on straw. You're just making your problem worse. I should have gathered up the oranges that fell, he thought, and went to sleep dreaming of the tart sweet taste of them and the sticky feel of the red juice on his fingers. Little finger hates that. <laughs> Dawn came too soon. That, that could be a long night line, right? If if Dawn, the sword Dawn, coming up from Starfall, if, if John is going to wield it like like uh like Dave and I have, have discussed on so many times on, on, on his streams, Dawn came too soon. One would hope. Right in a long night situation, if dawn is the key, if dawn is light bringer, one would hope that it comes quickly and that we're not going through this for too long. Although, hopefully, more than just one single fucking night like the show gave us. <laughs> Outside the stables, the smallest of the three horse litters stood ready the cedar wood litter with the red silk draperies. The captain chose 20 spears to accompany it. Out of the 30 who were posted at the water gardens, the rest would stay to guard the grounds and children, some of whom were the sons and daughters of great lords and wealthy merchants. Although the prince had spoken of departing at first light, Arya Hota knew that he would dawdle. Whilst the maester helped Doran Martell to bathe and bandage up his swollen joints and linen wraps, soaked with soothing lotions, the captain donned a shirt of copper scales as befit his rank, and a billowing cloak of, of dun and yellow sand silk to keep the sun off the copper. The day promised to be hot, and the captain had long ago discarded the heavy horsehair cape and studded leather tunic he had worn in Norvos, which were like to cook a man in Dorne. He had kept his iron half-helm with its crest of sharpened spikes, but now he wore it wrapped in orange silk, weaving the cloth in and around the spikes. There it is. So, so with the Godfather, right, it's not just the oranges, but also the color orange itself. And then that's what comes up in other works, like in, in, in The Sopranos and Breaking Bad, in The Wire. Uh, what, when they draw upon the, uh, the dangerous orange trope, it's not always just the fruit. The color itself is, is a harbinger. So Ario wrapping his half helm in orange silk is it's just it's just foreshadowing like this guy is going to die at some point and when we get to the winds of winners um whenever that drops like it, it's it's been said like george has too many povs going around for this book 
he's going to have to start thinning thinning the herd, so to speak. And Ario, Ario definitely seems like one who's on the chopping block because, like Eris Oakheart later, he, he's he's expendable. He he's he doesn't have the level of importance that that uh, your Tyrians and your Dannys and your Johns, even though John died, but John's coming back. He's Jesus. Our uh, Ario Hota does not have that that significance. So he him. John Con, like those guys, those guys, I can see. Uh, as much as I hate to say, Victorian, the, these are the guys who, who, who are probably going to be like the one when George needs to start, you know, thinning, like thinning the herd, chopping some numbers, you know, get cutting some some weight. These are the guys. These are the guys. <laughs> Uh, elsewise, the sun beating down on the metal would have his head pounding before they saw the palace. The prince was still not ready to depart. He had decided to break his fast before he went, with a blood orange and a plate of gull's eggs diced with a bits of ham and fiery peppers. There's the oranges again. <laughs> then naught would do, but he must say farewell to several of the children who had become special favorites. The Dalt Boy and Lady Br Blackmont's brood, and the round-faced orphan girl whose father had sold cloth and spices up and down the green blood. So the Dalt Boy here. Uh, so how that that's a that's a lemon. That's a that's a lemon call out. So because it's it's also just like with the orange, the color orange. Um, there's also the other citrus fruits, lemons, limes, those sorts of things. Um, and that will be the next serious video I do. Will be the follow up to Blood and Citrus. Will be Lies and Citrus, looking at Danny and her lemon tree. But the lemons are also a big thing in Dorn. Uh, Sansa's lemon cakes. Peter sending for lemons from Dorn. Uh, all of that's going to be significant. And so too is uh, Doran's uh, later plan. His original plans for Arianne and Tyre and uh, to send Arianne to Tyrosh to be the Arkans. Because uh, lemons grow um, in Tyrosh, in Mir, in Volantis, in Lys. Like th those are those are important. And and also too, um, Do we said Doran is dawdling again. The gout, Doran being slow to act. He says he wants to leave at first light, but we get the impression that here it's like it's got to be like. Mid midday, it's like 10, 11 a.m. If 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 a song of ice and fire had like you know real world hours, so it's not this is not first thing in the morning anymore when, when we're getting at when we're getting to 10 or 11 a.m. It was midday before they uh So spice. Yes. Okay. So Doran kept a splendid mirish blanket over his legs as he spoke with them to spare the young ones the sight of his swollen bandaged joints. It was midday before they got underway. The prince in his litter, Maester Kalit riding on a donkey, the rest afoot. Again, this is what I'm saying. Like, I want to leave first thing in the morning. It's it's 1130 and we're only just now getting there. Five spearmen walked ahead and five behind, with five more flanking the litter to either side. Ario Hota himself took his familiar place at the left hand of the prince, resting his long axe on a shoulder as he walked. The road from Sunspear to the water gardens ran beside the sea, so they had a cool, fresh breeze to soothe them as they made their way across a sparse, red-brown land of stone and sand and twisted, stunted trees. Halfway there, the second sand snake caught them. <laughs> yeah, so, so snake, snake catching them, you know, viper <clears throat> catching, catching a mouse in its jaws. She appeared suddenly upon a dune, mounted on a golden sand steed with a mane like fine white silk. Even a horse, the lady Nim looked graceful, dressed all in shimmering lilac robes and a great silk cake cape of cream and copper that lifted at every gust of wind and made her look as if she might take flight. And this is all covering her stilt suit, okay? Because it, 
Dune. <laughs> uh, um, so, so along with all the Godfather references, Dorn is also going to be our hotbed of Dune references. Frank Herbert. Um, oh yeah, uh, uh, Children of Dune is Children of Dune is coming. Uh, if you haven't seen Quinn's ideas latest video, uh, Children of Dune, that's greenlit. We're gonna get a third D Dune movie. Okay, so Nymeria Sand was five and 20 and slender as a willow. Her straight black hair, worn in a long braid, round up with red gold wire, made a widow's peak above her dark eyes, just as her father's had. And okay, so here too. So she's got all the daughters again have the viper eyes. She has his widow's peak. Sorella Sand also has the widow's peak. And when we meet Alaras the Sphinx, um, the one, one of, uh, um, oh my God, I'm blanking on his name. Marwin, one of Marwin's, uh, acolytes, uh, Alaras, uh, who, who, uh, his father is Dornish and mother is a sour Islander conspicuously just as Sorella Sand has a Dornish father and a summer Island mother. Uh, they have the, they have the widows, this widow's peak. Uh, with she uh, she had all the beauty that her elder sister lacked, but Obara's mother had been an old town whore, whilst Nim was born from the noblest blood of old Volantis. A dozen mounted spearmen tailed her, their round shields gleaming in the sun. They followed her down the dune. The prince had tied back the curtains on his litter, the better to enjoy the breezing blowing off the sea. Lady Nim fell in beside him, slowing her pretty golden mare to match the litter's pace. Okay, uh, let's see. What kind of voice can I get? I am very bad. <laughs> How dare you forget the name of our sacred leader, Morrow? <laughs> I know, I know. The, ch the Church of Starry Wisdom is going, is going to declare me a heathen because I blanked on Morrowind's name there for a moment. <laughs> Okay, a uh, let's see, Nim, 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 Nim. Oh, I wish I had Nim Shadow here for uh, uh, the dire, uh, yeah, the Dire Wolf City ladies. I get again. I'm gonna extend invites to them for more because I am so bad at giving women voices. Well, Mets uncle, she sang out as if she had been chance that brought her here. May I ride with you to Sunspear? I only have like one voice for women and that's the one. <laughs> the captain was on the opposite side of the litter from Lady Nim, yet he could hear every word she said. I would be glad of it, Prince Doran replied, though he did not sound glad to the captain's ears. Gout and grief make for poor companions on the road. By which the captain knew him to mean that every pebble drove a spike through his swollen joints. The gout cannot help, she said, but my father had no use for grief. Vengeance was more to his taste. Is it true that Gregor Clegane admitted slaying Elia and her children? He roared out his guilt for all the court to hear. The prince admitted, Lord Tywin had promised us his head. And a Lannister always pays his debts, said Lady Nim. Yet it seems to me that Lord Tywin means to pay us with our own coin. I had a bird from our sweet Sir Damon, who swears my father tickled that monster more than once as they fought. If so, Sir Gregor is as good as dead, and no thanks to Tywin Lannister. So that's so she's referring to Damon Sand. So, despite the animosity, you know, it, it, it goes to show here, right? Like despite the initial animosity of Dorne when the Targaryens first came with guys like Aegon the Conqueror and, and Daeron the First, the young dragon, after Daeron the Good comes into the fold, Daeron the Second, and Dorne is brought into the fold through marriage, then there becomes more of a respect for Targaryens. And we see that. So now we have Dornish uh, getting Targaryen names. Here is a Dornish man, a Dornish knight, uh, who has the who is named Damon? 
I don't know where my Damon is. He is skulking about somewhere, and I'm actually surprised he has not jumped up for pets yet, but he's here. Um, so the prince grimaced. Whether it was from the pain of a gout or his niece's words, the captain could not say. It may be so. Maybe. I say it is. Obara would have me go to war. Nim laughed. Yes, she wants to set the torch to Old Town. She hates that city as much as our little sister loves it. Well, if Obara wants to set the torch to, to Old Town, she's going to have to fight Euron for it because he's going to be the one to light the high tower. <laughs> and you? Nim glanced over a shoulder to where her companions rode a dozen lengths behind. I was abed with the Fowler twins when the word reached me, the captain heard her say. You know the Fowler words. Let me soar. That is all I ask of you. Let me soar, uncle. I need no mighty host. Only one sweet sister. Obara. Tain. Obara is too loud. Tyene is so sweet and gentle that no man will suspect her. Obara would make Old Town our father's funeral pyre, but I am not so greedy. Four lives will suffice for me, Lord Tywin's golden twins, as payment for Elia's children, the old lion for Elia herself, and last of all, the little king for my father. The boy has never wronged us. The boy is a bastard born of treason, incest, and adultery, if Lord Stannis can be believed. The playful tone had vanished from her voice, and the captain found himself watching her through narrowed eyes. Her sister Obara wore her hip, her whip upon her hip and carried a spear where any man could see it. Lady Nim was no less deadly, though she kept her knives well hidden. Only royal blood can wash out my father's murder. All right, so so Nim here is giving us another aspect of the femme fatale trope. Now, if Obara is like I said, she she's like the She Hulk. Nim is that quiet assassin. Uh, she's got the she's got the knives up her sleeves. She's ready to throw. She's she'll pull them out and throw them, and she'll 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 dance the dance at a moment's notice. But but they're they're. They're there, but they're out of sight. They're they're hidden, and and she is well poised to to pull them out. So so again, it's uh the the femme fatale is what is what we get with Nim, and and that's just George George going um playing upon upon tropes of 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 the woman assassin, different aspects in which we can see this: the warrior woman, uh, the femme fatale here, and then Tyeen. Who who we'll see later, um, and she she's the poisoner. Um, we we hear the line, uh, "Poison is a woman's weapon." Is a woman's weapon here all throughout this, and that's where Tyene plays plays that role. And and it's weird too because Tyene's also the daughter of a Septon and play a Septa. I'm sorry, and plays that role. So it's like it's almost like she's a nun. And and in fact, that's that's the role she's going to be given to play when. When Doran sets her out on the world, her mission is to ingratiate herself with the High Sparrow. So, as the daughter of a Septa, she'll probably be, you know, disguising herself a a as a Septa. So it's it's like like dressing yourself up as a nun to get close to the Pope. That's going to be Tyene's uh, Tyene's mission. So going back. Uh, she kept her knives well hidden. Only royal blood can wash out my father's murder. Oberon died during single combat, fighting in a matter that was none of his concern. I do not call that murder. Call it what you will. We sent them the finest man in Dorne, and they are sending back a bag of bones. You know, and that is like Ned, right? Ned is... You could say with say that with Ned Stark, we sent we sent them the finest man in the north, and we're getting back a bag of bones, and they might not even get it. <laughs> um, um, if Barbary Dustin has her way, he went beyond he went beyond anything I asked of him. Take the measure of this boy king and his council, and make note of their strengths and weaknesses. I told him on the terrace, we were eating orange. 
Before Oberyn Martell left, he was eating a goddamn orange. Find us friends if there are any to be found. Learn what you can of Elia's end, but see that you do not provoke Lord Tywin unduly. Those were my words to him. Oberyn laughed and said, when I have provoked any man unduly, you would do better to warn the Lannisters against provoking me. He wanted justice for Elia, but he would not wait. So now this was not Doran's intention, you know, to send his brother to die, but that's what happened. Godfather part two, um, it's a different, it's a different idea of brother and of brother and brother, but Michael Corleone making the decision to have his brother Fredo killed. And right before it, he takes a big bite of an orange. So, but, but the difference here is that Oberyn, unlike Michael, who, who fully wants his brother Fredo to die and Fredo, um, I think there's, there's a moment where I believe Fredo will come the idea of Fredo, Fredo Corleone, uh, plays another key role in the Dorish plot, but still, it's it's one brother, it's one brother sending another one off, and 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 that brother dies. Though here, it, it, in in Michael's case, it's fully intentional. In in, Ober, in Oberyn's case, that was not what he wanted to happen, but it happened, and he knows that Dorne is calling for blood. He knows again the whole Sicilian thing, the the blood for blood aspect. But at the same time, he's like, well, I can't really justify it. He died in a trial by combat. Like, he knew what he was doing. He read the words. He, he, you know, he, he signed, he's, he signed the terms of service. Like, that, that's it. He waited 10 and 7 years, the Lady Nim broke in. Were it you they killed, my father would have led his banners north before your corpse was cold. Worry you, the spears would be falling thick as rain upon the marches now. And we can kind of play that into a, uh, if we think House of the Dragon, uh, a Damon Viserys uh, idea of this, of what would, well, we know what, what would Damon do if Viserys died? Well, we know, <laughs> we know Damon would go to war. Um, but if Damon were the one to die, what would Viserys Targaryen's actions be, especially with someone like Otto Hightower whispering in his ear? W would would Viserys go to war for Damon the way Damon would go for for Viserys? Well, here we're we're seeing like Nim is telling him, Oberyn would go to war for you, and it doesn't matter what the circumstances of your death were. If someone was behind it, Oberyn would be taking a fight to them. Why will you not do the same? That is the perception the Sand Snakes have of Doran. When we come to find out, no, Doran is planning to take the fight. He has plans. He has not. He has not forgotten. He does want blood for blood but he is being very, very secretive in it, but also, unfortunately, very slow in the movements to carry it out. I do not doubt it. No more should you doubt this, my prince. My sisters and I shall not wait ten and seven years for our vengeance. She put her spurs into the mare, and she was off, galloping towards Sunspear, with her tail in hot pursuit. The prince leaned back against his pillows and closed his eyes, but Hotan knew he did not sleep. He is in pain. For a moment, he considered calling Maester Caled up to the litter, but if Prince Doran had wanted him, he would have called himself. The shadows of the afternoon were long and dark, and the sun was as red and swollen as the prince's joints before they glimpsed the towers of Sunspear to the east. All right, so shadows is is an uh, that's an other's invocation, and for a place like Dorne, which is a desert, like uh, the idea of the others would be very very out of place in this hot sunny desert. So instead, we get the shadows uh, as as being our sort of stand in here. Uh, 
Sunspear is and 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 its bordering of the Shadow City is is how we get our others talk for such a for such a very hot sunny place. First, the slender spear tower, a hundred and a half feet tall and crowned with a spear of gilded steel that added another 30 feet to its height. Then the mighty tower of the sun with its dome of gold and leaded glass. Last, the dun colored sand ship looking like some monstrous dromen that had washed ashore and turned to stone. So going on, uh, just how the Dornish were done dirty and the Ironborn were done dirty, Naga's ribs, we've long theorized, is is the is not the remains of a sea dragon, but the remains of a weirwood ship that have petrified. And here we're given uh, a similar thing here in Dorn with with the sand ship. Um, oh, and then there's also um, in in Elric of Mel Nibine, there is the ship that can sail across land. And so the sand ship uh, being here, looking like a dromen that had washed the shore, yet it's here in Sunspear, which is, which is inland. Only three leagues of coast road divided Sunspear from the water gardens, yet they were two different worlds. Their children frolic. Oh, yes, yes. And like the, the ship that sails. Yeah, the ship that sails on land and sea. And yeah, it's also it's also giving a, a black gate imagery. And and the red, the red mountains on the white sands is Weirwood imagery for, for Dorne. Again, like we don't know of Weirwoods growing in, 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 in Dorne like we do with lemon trees and orange trees. But instead we get these these substitutions these stand-ins to give us to give us ideas of weirwoods, the others, uh, the Black Gate, and and all these things in Dorn because to have them there, which is in, which is such a contrast to the north, is it would be out of place. But that is again that is more of our ice and fire. John and why John being a northerner born in Dorn is is a contrast the and it's why um in the far far east the gray waste becomes like the intermingling of all of that because it is a frozen desert where potentially others might be because they have their own sort of wall and that is the five forts but i'm going to i'm going to bring it in before i go way too far out out into the into the weeds <laughs> on that one but but still it's 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 a thing uh so so their children frolic naked in the sun music played in tiled courtyards and the air was sharp with the smell of lemons and blood oranges no no actually one more thing on that because i've been making ario hota the heavy and i brought up norvos how it's like how it's like us the central part of russia the gray waste is like Siberia, so a frozen desert um, being more north and south culture intermixed. And Ariohota is the same thing. He is a fish out of water here, uh, uh, a guy from a cold, from from a cold, from a cold realm coming down and now living in this in this hot desert. He 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 is like an other that has come to Dorn in that sense. Here the air smelled of dust, sweat, and smoke, and the nights were alive with the bubble with a babble of voices. In place of the pink marble of the water gardens, Sunspear was built from mud and straw and colored brown and dun. Um, for real. I thought moss of East Siberia. Uh okay. So, um now Mosavi seems to I mean, the name alone is, is drawing on Muscovy, old uh, Mosc Moscow. Um, so think of like early Moscow and the and the cut in the Kievan Rus. The gray waste is more of the Siberia thing, especially too when it when it borders uh, the can and and Mosavy and the gray waste are also on the cannibal sands. So you have like this this place where where deciduous forest is meeting is meeting tundra in this frozen desert and then deserts and then these sandy deserts in between. Um, 
there's this place in in Far East Russia called the Chani Sands. <laughs> and Chani is a name. Oh, and Chani is also the name of a character from Dune. So, you know, make of that what you will. Um, I actually did this in my Going Further East, the Moss of East stream, where I talked, I talked, I brought up the Chani Sands and and this part where where forest, tundra, and desert all come together in one spot. And I brought up the I brought pictures. It's a very it's 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 beautiful actually like it's 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 because it's it's like such it's like it, it like like the chani sands is like a place that you think should not exist like these three things should not be here all side by side and yet they are so that's where i see like mosavi the gray waste and the cannibal sands all coming together is is this uh this far east Ste uh, the steps of R the steps of Russia, the part the part of Russia that you never hear enough about, uh, north of Mongolia and all that, where where you still have um, um, where Asian Russians of Asian descent and and uh, uh, people uh, just just all these different uh, Turkic groups and and uh, the the ta Tatars and and uh, uh, all the Cossacks and all all the other uh, you know, Russia has a lot, it's, it's the biggest country in the world. So it has a lot of ethnic groups out there. And, and it's those, those people, those are what are, are what I think George is like, kind of like bringing in with, with those ideas. But it, we went too far out into the waste. All right. We got to get back to Dorn. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, check out the, if you want to know more about that, please check out, check out the Moss of e video. And, and, uh, cause I also did that one's, uh, if you want to hear too, also about a uh, Slavic myth, uh, the Lashai and the, and the Vladna that, that gets brought up in that one. Um, so the ancient stronghold of house Martel stood at the easternmost end of a little jut of stone and sand surrounded on three sides by the sea. Uh, to the west, in the shadows of Sunspear's massive walls, mud brick shops and windowless hovels clung to the castle like barnacles to a galley's hull. Stables and inns and wine sinks and pillow houses had grown up west of those, many enclosed by walls of their own, and yet more hovels had, rid had risen beneath those walls. And so, and so, and so, as the bearded priest would say, Compared to Tyrosh or Mir or Great Norvos, the shadow city was no more than a town, yet it was the nearest thing to a true city that these Dornish had. And that's, again, more North talk, like um, huge, huge, huge cities, like huge metropolises, things like High Garden, Old Town, Casterly Rock. They don't exist in in Dorn or the north winterfell is big but it pales in comparison to those places uh you got to talk about the sand ship nagar i i did bring up not i did i did bring up the sand ship and nagar i brought it up earlier but yeah yeah so the sand ship and i also compared it to elrica melnubide the the ship that the ship that sails on land and sea yeah um uh, we could bring it up again, yeah. So the the sand ship uh, is is paralleling the the Naga's ribs. It's up. It's out. It's out of place here, uh, because because it looks like uh, some monstrous Droman that had washed ashore, and Naga's ribs uh, would be like the uh, the remains of a upturned, upside down weirwood boat. That is what Naga's ribs more than likely are more more than the idea of Naga ribs being the remains of a sea dragon, probably the petrified remains of a weirwood boat. And a similar thing happens here. And it's possible too. It's possible that weirwood ships made it to uh, to Dorn. Uh, if we think of House Dane as being great empire of the Dawn people, and remember that Starfall is, is on an island. Uh, an island flip an island in the middle of the torrentine um it would have taken a ship to get there so so the sand ship can be uh our our um j just uh, our, our clue to old world ships coming from other places coming to dorn 
and Dorn, along with first men who crossed the arm of Dorn, coming from the what coming from the uh coming from out of the out of the western end of Essos, then ships coming from the other direction across the sunset sea and settling in Dorne and the islands that are scattered around Dorne. And then that brings in together first men and and uh ancient mariner uh from the far east of Essos cultures. So uh-huh. Does this tell us anything about Naga's ribs or just Nymeria Mar yeah, that's who Mar uh, so Nymeria marries a Dane. Um she also marries an Uller as well. She had three husbands, but her final husband is, is a Dane. And I believe he was also the sword of the morning in of his of his time. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, the April, you, you you hit the nail on the head. It's a weirwood boat where no weirwood boat should be, just like Naga's ribs would be also a weirwood boat where weirwoods should not be because weirwo weirwoods can't grow on the Iron Islands because of how stony and loose the soil is. Well, for Dorn, it's like saying weirwoods can't grow here because of the sand. Like this is this is not uh this is not an environment that it that is that is set up for these kinds of trees it's set up for these other types of plants but weirwood being here is very out of place and again that is why i said like uh that is why george has to use these substitutes that's why the red mountains and the white sands the red and white are our weirwood symbolism and the shadows and the shadow city are our stand-ins for others where in a place where they wouldn't be uh, mist and snow and all the other things that others would be associated with. So Lady Nim's arrival had preceded theirs by some hours, and no doubt she had warned the guards of their coming, for the threefold gate was open when they reached it. Only here were the gates lined up one behind the other to allow visitors to pass beneath all three of the winding walls directly to the old palace, were first making their way through miles of narrow alleys, hidden courts, and noisy bazaars. Prince Doran had closed the draperies of his litter as soon as the spear tower came in sight, yet still the small folk shouted out to him as the litter passed. The sand snakes have stirred them to a boil, the captain thought uneasily. They crossed the squalor of the outer crescent and went through the second gate. Beyond, the wind stank of tar and salt water and rotting seaweed, and the crowd grew thicker with every step. So this is like some green uh tar, salt water, rotting seaweed. So this is this is this is green sea talk, and the sea is angry, right? The people of Dorn are angry. Um, and 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 it's just it's it's palpable. There's just like an electricity in the air. It's like the moment before a riot is about to break out when they when when the people of Dorne see Dorne and Martell's litter coming through and everyone wants an answer of what are you going to do? Oberyn Martell is dead. We love that man. <laughs> they crossed the squalor of the outer crescent and went through the second gate. Beyond, yeah, so, and rotting seaweed, and the crowd grew thicker with every step. Make way, make way for Prince Doran, Ario Hotop boomed out, thumping the butt of his long axe on the bricks, giving his wife another spank. Make way for the Prince of Dorn. The prince is dead, a woman shrilled behind him. To Spears, a man bellowed from a balcony. Doran called some highborn voice. To the Spears. Hota gave up looking for the speakers. The press was too thick, and a third of them were shouting, To Spears! Vengeance for the Viper! By the time they reached the third gate, the guards were shoving people aside to clear a path for the prince's litter, and the crowd was throwing things. One ragged boy darted past the spearmen with a half-rotten pomegranate in one hand. But when he saw Hota, Arya Hota on his path with long axe at the ready, he let the fruit fall on throne and beat a quick retreat. Others farther back, others farther back let fly with lemons, limes, and oranges, crying war 
war to the spears. One of the guards was hit in the eye with a lemon, and the captain himself had an orange splatter off his foot. I think I've kind of, you know, I think I've driven home to this point the oranges, but then we also have the other citrus fruits, the lemons and the pomegranates. Now, to be fair, uh, pomegranates technically are not a citrus fruit, but that's also in the way of saying that strawberries technically aren't berries. And that is to say, get the fuck out of here with your technicalities. Just because you're right doesn't mean you're interesting. I'm quoting my favorite comedian, John Mulaney, but you get the point, right? The pomegranates feel just as home at home with the oranges as the lemons and the limes do. <laughs> and, and the pomegranates are a big thing because, because uh, uh, the story of Hades and Persephone, which I brought up in the Blood and Citrus video with... Um, uh, with Sansa and Littlefinger when he offers her half of a blood orange. Um, it's it's a stand-in for Hades and Persephone when she eats half of the pomegranate seeds that are offered to her. And that is what binds her to Hades. And that is why she goes to visit him in fall and winter, returns in spring and summer. And that's why we get the seasons. But in Ice and Song of Ice and Fire, we know the seasons are out of whack. It's like Persephone is going and she's not coming home for years. Uh, so, and then, yeah. And so getting, he's one's hit in the eye with a lemon. You know what happens if you get lemon juice in your eye, it stings. And then the captain himself, an orange splatters off his foot. It's just like more foreshadowing, right? That Ario Hota is, is not long for the world. At least not in story. <laughs> Because we're, what, thir 13 years without a book? Come on. I'm hoping. I'm hoping George's cryptic post on on, on his uh, on his not a blog is, is a sign and not just him trolling. Uh, no answer came from within the litter. Doran Martell stayed cloaked within his silken walls until the thicker walls of the castle swallowed all of them and the portcullis came down behind them with a rattling crunch. The sounds of shouting dwindled away slowly. Princess Ariane was waiting in the outer ward to greet her father with half the court about her. The old blind Seneschal Ricasso, Sir Manfrey, Sir Manfrey Martel the Castellan. Excuse me. I'm just going to take, uh, I've been talking a lot. Let me get it. Some green tea. Okay. Sir Manfrey Martel the Castellan. Which I don't think, I don't think they mention how he's related to Oberyn. Um, I assume some kind of cousin. Uh, young Maester Miles with his gray robes and silky perfumed beard. Two score of Dornish knights in flowing linen of half a hundred hues. Okay, so, um, so this Maester, his perfumed, he has his perfumed beard and there's a blind seneschal. And if we think of Quaith's warning to Danny of beware the perfume Seneschal, and here we have two. We have a Seneschal and we have a maester wearing perfume. And, and if we take Barbary Dustin at her word, the maesters are gray rats. Um, seeds are like children. There's the Dornish connection to tilt children and pomegranate. Yep, yep. And she is eating and over. Yep. Yeah, it's all it's all here. Like the 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 sigils tell a story, the food tells a story. Um, and yeah, and just because pomegranates may not be citrus does not put them out of place with the oranges and, and the le lemons and limes. These are all these are all serving the same narrative purpose. And here, yeah, again, and and here we got a, gr a perfumed gray rat and a seneschal. So things that Danny has been warned about have found their way into Doran Martell's court. And Doran Martell's story is one that's also going to be potentially, potentially linked to Blackfires, um, assuming if Fagon does turn out to be a Blackfire, which is, you know, the prevailing theory. 
So so it's linking it's linking Doran and and Danny's story in a way. There's going to be a way where Doran and Danny's story come together, and it's probably going to be through through Fagon since Quentin's dead. He's dead. So. Oh, shit. So, all right. Maester Miles with his great two score of Dornish knights in flowing linen of half a hundred hues. Little Marcella Baratheon stood with her septa and Sir Eris of the Kingsguard sweltering in his white enameled scales. All right. So, so yeah. So he has, Eris has not learned the lessons that Ario has learned of, dude, you need to give up the clothing you came with. And, and adapt to the atmosphere and the environment here. He's still wearing the heavy, the heavy Kingsguard stuff. So, so Ario Hota and Eris Oakheart are both fish out of waters in that sense. But Ario, at least for the years that he has been here, has some somehow learned to adapt. Not completely. He's always going to feel like a stranger in Dorne. But he's at least he's at least come to terms with like I can't keep wearing my hair shirt. Like I gotta I gotta wear light light fabrics and linens. Princess Ariane strode to the litter on snakeskin sandals laced up to her thighs. Her hair was a mane of jet black ringlets that fell to the small of her back, and around her brow was a band of copper suns. She is still a little thing, the captain thought. Where the sand snakes were tall, Ariane took after her mother, who stood but five foot two. Yet beneath her jeweled girdle and loose layers of flowing purple silk and yellow samite, she had a woman's body, lush and roundly curved. Father, she announced as the curtains opened. Sun spirit rejoices at your return. Yes, I heard the joy. The prince smiled wanly and cupped his daughter's cheek with a reddened, swollen hand. You look what? Um, look, cupping her face, um, her lush face with a red shaped hand. It's, it, it's that's like more red comic talk. We can also think of like uh, of uh, Euron's moon face and his possible red and the possibility of his red eye. Um, if it, if it if what's under his eye patch now mirrors um, his 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 personal sigil, so Doran's red chafed hands and and they do get they do come up again um, in the princess in in the princess in the tower when he finally reveals his plans and he hands um, Arian the Savas piece. It's made mention about his red swollen red chafed hands again. His hands are red comets. You look well. Captain, be so good as to help me down from here. Hota slid his long axe into its sling across his back and gathered the prince into his arms, tenderly so as not to jar his swollen joints. Even so, Doran Martell bit back a gasp of pain. I have commanded the cooks to prepare a feast for this evening, Ariane said, with all your favorite dishes. I fear I cannot do them justice. The prince glanced slowly around the yard. I do not see Tyene. She begs a private word. I sent her to the throne room to await your coming. The prince sighed. Very well. Captain, the sooner I am done with this, the sooner I may rest. Hota bore him up the long stone steps of the Tower of the Sun to the great round chamber beneath the dome where the last light of the afternoon was slanting down through thick windows of many colored glass to dapple the pale marble with diamonds of half a hundred colors. There, the third sand snake awaited them. So, Doran here, this is like uh, a Bran and Hodor moment of Hodor having to carry Bran up the stairs because he can't make it himself. I've talked about how George will take like these... Uh, these bigger overarching ideas and writ them small, Bran being our 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 king in the end, and and probably the one who's going to be um, our database of knowledge, so to say. Like if if we 
talking in computer terms again, brand downloading the Weirwood net, downloading all of the knowledge before the Weirwood net is closed and given back to the others. If that truly is our, our end in terms of reconciliation <laughs> and brand becomes like an external hard drive. Well, Doran, for the knowledge that he has, um, the plans he's making, the things he knows that nobody else knows, if, if, if Bran is an external hard drive, Doran's a USB. <laughs> and here, and but here he is, um, he is being carried up the stairs by a simple giant man <laughs> who is Arya Hota. So, so it's, it's an overarching idea, but writ smaller here playing out. She was sitting across, she was sitting cross-legged on a pillow beneath the raised dais where the high seat stood, but she rose as they entered, dressed in a clinging gown of pale blue, pale blue samite with sleeves of marish lace that made her look as innocent as the maid herself. So, again, we're bringing up, uh, when I brought up Nim and the whole femme fatale aspect, and here it is again, but with Tyene, she's made to look even more innocent. Like Nim, you can still get the sense of, even though her knives are hidden, there's still a bit an edge to her. Tyene is brought up as so sweet and demure, you would never suspect her of anything. And that's why her role as a poisoner has so much more going for it, because poison is silent. You never see it coming. You never expect it. Tyene slipping something, you know, slipping someone a Mickey in their drink. And that Mickey is the tears of lease or something like that. It just comes off like there. It's, 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 it's right there. And it's again, different aspects of, of how women of women and, and warriors and women's in war and women and how they fight and the different things that go to them and the whole femme fatale woman assassin and, and Doran's daughters like picking from every angle that that trope could possibly have. Uh, in one hand was a piece of embroidery she had been working on, in the other, a pair of golden needles. Her hair was gold as well, and her eyes were deep blue pools, and yet somehow they reminded the captain of her father's eyes, though Oberyn's had been black as night. All of Prince Oberyn's daughters have his viper eyes, Hota realized suddenly. The color does not matter. So yeah, the, the viper eyes. They can run the gamut of brown, black, green, blue, or what have you. Tyene's got the blue eyes, um, but but it's the shape. The shape is the dead giveaway. Like, like snake eyes, like slits, just vi viper eyes. Uncle, said Tyene San, I have been waiting for you. Captain, help me to the high seat. There were two seats on the dais, near twin to one another, save that one had the Martell spear inlaid in gold upon its back, whilst the other bore the blazing Roynish sun that had flown from the masts of Nymeria ships when, they, when first they came to Dorne. The captain placed the prince beneath the spear and stepped away. Oh, okay, so so Doran is the sun, and he's placed below the spear. So if the spear were to drop, that would be the sun being stabbed. So right there is more long night imagery. Going back again to, to the Martell sigil itself. The sun being stabbed, if the sun were stabbed, the sun were to go out, that brings on the long night. And yeah, so like the spear, him sitting below, the spear is like, it's like tilting above him, like the sword of Damocles just waiting to drop. <laughs> it's another orange splattering on the floor. Uh, Doran, yeah. So does it hurt so much? Lady Tyene's voice was gentle and she looked as sweet as summer strawberries. Her mother... <laughs> Pomegranates aren't citrus and strawberries aren't berries. Her mother had been a septa and Tyene had an air of almost otherworldly innocence about her. Is there aught that I might do to ease your pain? Say what you would and let me rest. I am weary, Tyene. 
I made this for you, uncle. Tyene unfolded the piece she had been embroidering. It showed her father, Prince Oberon, mounted on a sand steed and armored all in red, smiling. When I finish, it is yours to help you remember him. I am not like to forget your father. That is good to know. Many have wondered. We're not being passive aggressive at all right there, are we? <laughs> Lord Tywin has promised us the mountain's head. He is so kind. But a headsman's sword is no fit end for brave Sir Gregor. We have prayed so long for his death. It is only fair that he pray for it as well. I know the poison that my father used, and there is none slower or more agonizing. Soon we may hear the mountain screaming, even here in Sunspear. Oh, okay, oh, so the mountain screaming um, gives you the image like of mountains crumbling. Uh, so like the wall, the wall falling. If the if the if the if the, if the red comet hits. Oh, and also like the again, also going with you're on the scream of a hinge. Um, yeah, so so the comet smashing in and just the sa the sounds of screams, Nissa Nissa scream and all of that, just world shattering screams where wall fall and mountain crumbles and all of that. <laughs> so we may hear the mountain screaming even here in Sunspear, which is to say, yeah, if the wall falls or some an event like that happens, even Sunspear as far away from the north as it is, we'll still know something happened, right? Like an earthquake, and they can still, even though they're nowhere near it, they can still feel the shock waves. Prince Doran sighed. Obara cries to me for war. Nim will be content with murder. And you? War, said Tyene though not my sister's war. Dornishmen fight best at home, so I say let us hone our spears and wait. Okay, yeah, that's... I brought that up before. Dorn, Dorn is great when it comes to fighting a defensive war on their home turf, but to take the offensive, to, to, be, to make the attack themselves and to try and pierce through into the reach and into the stormlands and all the things Obara does, like that, then that's just going to make them sitting ducks. Tyene's got the other idea of she wants war too, but like, no, we need, it needs to be defensive. It needs to be fought on our terms, on our ground, in our home, on our land. Like that's how we do. We wait, wait and bleed. My hair's a red and gold. My hair is standing straight up. This is not the way I pictured me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's there, there we go. When the Lannisters and the Tyrells come down on us, we shall bleed them in the passes and bury them beneath the blowing sands as we have a hundred times before. If they should come down on us. Oh, but they must. For see the realm riven once more as it was before we wed the dragons. Father told me so. He said we had the imp to thank for, for sending us Princess Marcella. She is so pretty, don't you think? I wish that I had curls like hers. She was made to be a queen, just like her mother. Dimples bloomed in Tyene's cheeks. I would be honored to arrange the wedding and to see the making of the crowns as well. Tristane and Marcella are so innocent. I thought perhaps white gold with emeralds to match Marcella's eyes. Oh, diamonds and pearls would serve as well, so long as the children are wed and crowned. Then we need only hail Marcella as the first of her name, Queen of the Andals, the Roinar, and the First Men, and lawful heir to the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros, and wait for the lions to come. The lawful heir? The prince snorted. She is older than her brother, explained Tyene, as if he were some fool. Running the gambit there a bit, Dorn. <laughs> By law, the Iron Throne should pass to her. By Dornish law. When good King Daeron wed Princess Mariah and brought us into his kingdom, it was agreed that Dornish law would always rule in Dorn. And Marcella is in Dorn as it happens. You are technically correct. The best kind of correct. Unless you're going to bring up that pomegranates aren't citrus. So she is. His tone was grudging. 
Let me think on it. And that's what he said, right, to all of his nieces. Let me think on it. That's just, I that that's like when you're in your backseat of your car and you're like, can we stop for ice cream? And your parents say, we'll see. That always means no. Tyene grew cross. You think too much, uncle. Do I? Father said so. Oberon thought too little. Some men think because they are afraid to do. There is a difference between fear and caution. Oh, I must pray that I never see you frightened, uncle. You might forget to breathe. She raised a hand. The captain brought the butt of his long axe down upon the marble with a thump. Third spank. My lady, you presume. My lady, you presume. Step from the dais, if it please you. I meant no harm, Captain. I love my uncle, as I know he loved my father. Tyene went to one knee before the prince. I have said all I have come to say, uncle. Forgive me if I gave offense. My heart is broken all to pieces. Do I still have your love? Always. Give me your blessing then, and I shall go. Doran hesitated at half a heartbeat before placing his hand on his niece's head. Be brave, child. Oh, how not? I am his daughter. So in a way, if we talk about like Godfather sense, this is all like him placing his him, her asking for his blessing and he puts his his hand on her head. Again, his red shaped hand, his red comet hand, he places on her head. But you could also view this in a way almost like when the when uh the underlings kiss the don's hand as a sign of respect thank you don Vito. thank you don michael thank you don doran when they're asking for their favors but if doran's hands are red comets and he places them on their head again like the 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 stage is set not just for hota's death and for and for doran's if not his death by the end of it definitely his fall but the sand snakes are also lined up for death. And, and when we get to the second Ario Hota chapter, again, that snake stew really hammers it home. No sooner had she taken her leave than Maester Kalet hurried to the dais. My prince, sh she did not. Here, let me see your hand. He examined the palm first, then gently turned it upside down to sniff at the back of the prince's fingers. No. Good. That is good. There are no scratches, so... The prince withdrew his hand. Maester, could I trouble you for some milk of the poppy? A thimble cup will suffice. All right, so this is this is how deadly Tyene is. Just that second of him touching her is enough to make the maester believe she poisoned him. And that is why they say, like, like Tyene is actually, as sweet and demure as she comes off, is probably the most dangerous of the Sand Snakes. Like, it, 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 like she's coated in poison. Like, 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 like she's a, like those poison tree frogs, right? We're just a, we're just touching them. Like, just to get anywhere near her means you're going to be poisoned. <laughs> it's like, you made contact with her. I hope you don't... <laughs> Like you can't even give you can't give the girl a hug. She'll poison you. <laughs> and 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 also here too the idea that that Tyene might have poisoned her uncle. That it give it gives you the idea of that she might not be above kin slaying, right? Might be. Yep. <laughs> so the print uh the poppy. Yes, to be sure. Now I think. Doran urged gently, and Kalet scurried to the stairs. Outside, the sun had set. The light within the dome was the blue of dusk, and all the diamonds on the floor were dying. The prince sat in his high seat beneath the martel spear, his face pale with pain. After a... Excuse me. After a... Damn. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, when you're alone reading a whole chapter by yourself, it, it, it gets to you all this talking. Got a drink. Um, after a long silence, he turned to Ario Hota. Captain, he said, how loyal are my guards? Loyal. 
The captain did not know what else to say. All of them, or some. They are good men. Good Dornish men. They will do as I command. He thumped his long axe on the floor. I will bring the head of any man who would betray you. I want no heads. I want obedience. You have it. Serve, obey, protect. Simple vows for a simple man. In the, in the show, Tyene is the most powerful weapon. Correct. <laughs> the bad pussy. <laughs> you want the good girl, but you need a bad pussy. Yeah. God. The show. The show. Oh. How many men are needed? I will leave that for you to decide. It may be that a few good men will serve us better than a score. I want this done as quickly and as quietly as possible, with no blood spilled. Quick and quiet and bloodless, I. What is your command? You will find my brother's daughters, take them into custody, and confine them in the cells atop the spear tower. The sand snakes. The captain's throat was dry. Oh. All eight, my prince? The little ones also? The prince considered. Alaria's girls are too young to be a danger, but there are those who might seek to use them against me. It would be best to keep them safe in hand. Yes, the little ones as well. But first, secure Tyene, Nymeria, and Obara. As my prince commands. His heart was troubled. My little princess will mislike this. What of Sorella? She is a woman grown, almost twenty. Unless she returns to Dorne, there's naught I can do about Sorella, save pray that she shows more sense than her sisters. Leave her to her. Game. Gather up the others. I shall not sleep until I know that they are safe and under guard. All right, so right there. Um, are cl more clues that, that Sorella Sand is Alaris the Sphinx. Uh, leave her to her game in old town and then gather up the others. I mean, it's, it's meant to gather up the sand snakes, but for, for, for Ario, it's also means gathering up the other captains. And if Ario is, is, is our silent watcher, our other stand in gather up the others is a uh, meaning get, you know, get more of your people, get more others. <laughs> it will be done. The captain hesitated. When this is known in the streets, the common folk will howl. All Dorn will howl, said Dorn Martell in a tired voice. I only pray Lord Tywin hears from them in King's Landing, so he might know what a loyal friend he has in Sunspear. And then, so that line, that final line from Dorn, proclaiming himself a loyal friend, to to Tywin, but then when we know what he's really what he's really uh, on about, um, <laughs> it's like that passive aggressiveness that 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 we saw Tyeen show when she when she says like, "Oh, I thought maybe you'd forgotten," <laughs> and and that is like the sense of Doran. Um, we're given this idea, right, that Doran Martell. Is slow to move, but when he does, he moves with purpose. That everything is cold and calculating, and 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 it's just business, as we would, as like a Godfather say. But the thing is, it's not business. And Doran Martell, like uh, Doran Martell's marriage, for example, to uh, Malario of Norvos, they say it's it's the one action he made that was done out of pure emotion and wasn't some kind of calculated move. But even though Doran is making calculating moves, they are in pursuit of revenge, which means that they are in pursuit of pure emotion, right? That this is not just business. It is personal what Doran wants to achieve with the downfall of the Lannisters, with some kind of Targaryen restoration. And it is that pursuit, and 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 what makes it great with by bringing the Fagon angle into it, is that his pursuit of it may end up leading to 
a black fire on the throne unknowingly <laughs> because because his initial plans die with Viserys and that his plan B is is, is Daenerys but Quentin dies and when word reaches when word reaches Sunspear that Quentin's dead or his bones are returned or what have you however however Doran Martell comes to find out about that that might him look at Danny you know with weird eyes so then now now we got to move on to plan C which is Fagon and possibly a black fire so it's like Doran you know and again this is the idea of 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 things festering because you wait it too long your plans are going bad they're not going to have the initial the initial uh impact that you thought they were you didn't kill Tywin Tyrion did you waited on that. Um, you you aren't gonna get uh, your 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 Targaryen prince Viserys. You're not gonna have your daughter marry marry uh, marry a Targaryen prince. And even that was already kind of a a shitty plan because Dorne really didn't know Viserys. He didn't know how cruel Viserys was. If he did, he might have had more second thoughts of do I really want to marry my daughter to that you know the way that Oletta Tyrell has the thought of I ain't gonna let Marjorie marry Joffrey but revenge clouds your mind that is what it said of Sonny Corleone um his vengeance clouded his mind and made him make mistakes and then the set same happens for Michael Michael is more cold and calculating than Sonny was but he also has vengeance on his mind, and it's what leads to uh, the the estrangement from his family, uh, from his son Anthony, uh, the death of his daughter Mary. Oh, and it's I guess I can also point out, you know, Mary, the name Mary, short for Mary, can be short for Marianne, and Doran's daughter is Arianne, and she's probably gonna die. So that's why, I, like it, like. The idea that Doran Martell's story is going to mirror Michael Corleone comes up in so many different ways. And knowing that George is 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 you know inspired by not just myth and literature, but also music and mo music and movies, and you know, uh, so and 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 this whole dangerous Aaron thing is I have faith she's too. <laughs> she can't die. She's too pretty. No, no, sorry. Like, like I said in the video, in the Blood and Citrus video, seven snakes in the stew, seven young Martells out in the world. We got the the Ellis of the five snakes are out, are sent off to do things. Uh, Obara, Nim, Tyene are given specific missions. Sorella is in Old Town where Euron's about to about to be. Uh, Elia is accompanying Arianne. And then so so Ariane and and Quentin round out our seven, so seven snakes in the stew. Quentin's the first one to be thrown into the pot. That that that's where I see the story going, and and his his uh his sister and his cousins will follow, and and Dor and Martell will be left with nothing. And no, Ario Hotel will go down. He can't taste the stew despite how flavorful it is. Um, so, so he's he's on the chopping block, and then that leaves Doran Martell with one son. And if Doran Martell is Michael Corleone, then that makes Tristane Anthony. And the estrangement, um, especially if, especially when when Marcella's time comes, because Cersei's children are all fated to die. And if Doran Martell's plans end up being the thing that lead to Marcella's inevitable death. Then that's gonna make Trist then that has the potential of making Tristane come to doubt his father. Um, not because and and that's something that we need now. That's speculation on my part, I'll admit. We need more characterization from Tristane. We don't know if he has the feelings that Quentin did, where Quentin was so terrified of disappointing his father. We really don't get much of Tristane. We also really don't get too much of Anthony in the Godfather films, but yeah, it's 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 up there. It's up there. I th I think Tristane. I think Doran Martell's story 
following the path of Michael Corleone and Tristane being his Anthony. That makes sense to me. And Ari so Ariane dying the way that Mary, just like how Mary Corleone dies, makes sense to me. I got seven snakes in the stew, seven young Martell, seven Martells need to die. I think it's it's Sorella saying that every that more people I I would say are the one are are people are like you know being like no Sorella can't die Sorella's not gonna die, um I don't know <laughs> I don't I don't I don't I don't see any reason what what I don't see any reason to give that Sorella if she's even if she is Alaris the Sphinx gives her any more plot armor than any other Martell but it's just suffice to say that she's out there where bad things are about to happen so. So she's also a potential snake in the pot for the for for this stew. Okay, that's what I'm getting at. All of them are every every young Martell and every that has gone out, be they Doran's own children or the Sand Snakes. They they are they are potential fodder for this thing. <laughs> Watching too many mobster. Yeah, go home and get your fucking shine box. <laughs> I do. I do watch too. Um. Um. Before doing this, before doing this, while work obviously while working on Blood and Citrus, I was watching the God. I was refreshing myself with the Godfather movies, so I have very, very recently watched all three Godfather films, plus the Soprano. You know, plus plus I'm a huge Soprano fan. So I've made that obvious. And, and Goodfellas is Goodfellas, Goodfellas, and Casino are also way, way up there in in movies I like. So. Gotta get organized, but uh, yeah, yeah, you know. But it brings it brings a new perspective to the Dorn thing. If you read it, if you read Dorn Martell and the Martells as being a mafia syndicate, it gives a whole new perspective to the story. On top of them being, you know, uh, like the Moors and Iberian Spain and all and all all of that, um, and that is that's a way of George taking more modern day concepts but flushing them into a medieval narrative and and a godfather films especially because this is coming up in the 70s when george would have been you know, george would have been what in his 20s i believe coming his real coming of age is in is in the 70s the vietnam era and that's when these move that's when these movies are coming out so yeah it's it's uh Making making an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> um, if a horse's head ends up in anyone's bed, then we'll we'll know we'll know for sure. <laughs> Surprised that hasn't come up with like the Brackens and the Riswells and stuff. <laughs> uh, we are reading Brienne tomorrow. Adventures of Pod. And Oh, so we're not gonna we're not gonna do a, a brand chapter. Okay, I'm hey, I'm a fan of reading. Of uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of at the point where it's like it's like the the list of chapters that Dave wants to read and the list of chapters that I want to read. It's just ever growing. I hope we don't ever get to the point where you're like where we're like you know let's just start with the prologue in Game of Thrones and just follow it because that's treading on gray area territory with the city and nights. Gregor decapitated his. Oh yeah, Gregor did cut off a horse's head. Yeah, that's true. He did. Um, yeah. So so okay. So Brienne. Uh, so so Brienne chapter adventures of Pod and Brienne time. Yep. So we'll do. That's that's catch me with Dave uh, tomorrow. David Lightbringer on his YouTube channel. Uh, three p six p.m. Eastern, three p.m. Pacific. The same usual time. Um, I also know Dave had told me that he wants to do the Queen Maker. Because I, when I brought up the idea of like, hey, I think I want to cover the Dorans chapters, he's like, well, I want to do, I want to do the one uh, with the queen, with uh, where Ariane qu crowns Marcel, and I'm like, okay, well, we can do the Queen Maker on yours, and I'll tiptoe around the, you know, tiptoe around the other chapters. We'll do the Watcher with him on here, um, and I said I also want to extend invites to to people like Quinn the GM and Ara I Zebra do. Um, possible Eris Oakheart chapters and and Ariane chapters, the other Ariane chapters, not the Queen Maker, maybe Princess in the Tower. Um, yeah, and then after that, since we got, since we now know that Duncan Egg has been cast and that the Duncan Egg show is happening, um, that has revitalized my 
Blackfire fandom, sneaky, you know, treacherous Blackfire supporter that I am, which I would very much like to do. Oh, God. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you. I think it was easy to tell with Blood and Citrus that I had too much fun making that one, especially anytime I snuck a Tony Soprano line in there. I was just giggling to myself. <laughs> this says pulp. <laughs> you like it with pulp. <laughs> Because yeah, that, that's that snake stew food porn. It just screams at you. That that is just that's George. That's no longer like okay. So a song of ice and fire. George seems to do this in three three ways. Early when he really wants to plant an idea in your head, three ways. First, he'll make it very very subtle, so that only like the most perceptive of readers will pick up on him. Later, uh, he'll give a bit more and it's like to draw your attention to it of like hey this is important and then finally there would be a third one where he just basically ha completely hangs a light shade on it and it's just like all right for the rest of you slow pokes out there if you haven't gotten it by now this is important and that is what i see with the snake stew that is george just lift it you know that is george that food porn scene, that is George just lifting up the whole buffet table, bludgeoning you over the head and screaming, everyone in this room is going to die. That's the snake stew. <laughs> so yeah, that's why we're going to, that's why the watcher is one that we're, we'll, I'll have Dave on for the watcher for that one. Um, but anyway, after that, uh, after the door and stuff, I want to do uh, more of the black fire centric chapters, which means uh, like, Tyr Tyrion's dance chapters, especially when he's with Illyrio in the manse. I just really want to read the Tyrion and Illyrio chapters, just because I have a vo I have a voice in mind for Illyrio. Uh, Big Papa Mopatis, as I call him. I love it when you call me Big Papa. Throw your hands in the air. Black fire's out there. Um, but uh, <laughs> and and John Con chapters, which will be something else. All extended invite to Quinn the GM for for obvious reasons if if you haven't watched Quinn the GM's channel um he's like the Victorian the Victorian and John Con guy <laughs> but yeah that th those are the plans going forward uh to give Dorn its moment in the spot in the moment its moment in the sun that it never got in the show give Dorn Martell's story the justice, the vengeance, the fire and blood that it deserves. And then with Dunk, and then after that, in honor of Dunk and Egg, let's look at some of the Fagon centric chapters, the 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 ones where the where the where the black fire stuff is hidden in. And let's try and like really dig that up and put it on full display. So Thank you very much to everyone who came out for the stream. Uh, thank you, everyone who watched Blood and Citrus. Uh, thank you, everyone who sent in a PayPal. Anyone who's everyone, everyone who's been supporting the channel. You know, I, it's it, I'm very humble. Very, I love it. I thank I thank you so so much for the support and for the kindness and the nice words and, and everything you've done. Like I said, this this is a hobby of mine, and I and just the fact that so many people enjoy what I have to say or just want to hear me make a funny voice while I read a while I read to them uh, it's it, you know it, it makes me it makes me very happy thank you so I will see you to I will see most of you I assume tomorrow on Dave's channel for Brianne and pod um those are those are yeah those are those are also fun those are like also fun side adventures uh the Brianne and pod stuff and then and uh I'll continue. I said, I'm going to send out some messages. Hopefully we can get, I'll have Dave on for the watcher. I'll also try and bring other people in for uh, princess in the tower, the soiled night. And then we'll do black fires, black fires uh, chapters after that. So uh, that's it. That's everything for now. So uh, I will see you next time. Good night.